Awesome, Zoe. I am so excited to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, excited to be here. Sweet. And for anybody who doesn't know, Zoe's calling from the East Coast. I'm on the West Coast, so we kind of do a little swip swap. But Zoe, for anybody who is not familiar with you, can you just maybe give us a little bit of your background and what you kind of really focus on and just more about you? Because I think people that don't know you need to know you. Yeah, sure. Um, God, where do I start? I feel like I have to go all the way back to my childhood, but I won't do that too. So let's see. I, you know, I think I, I knew that I wanted to do this work from a young age. I just wasn't ready to go back to school and make the commitment that, you know, I had to make to get here. And I think I just had to learn a lot more, you know, life. I had to have a lot more life experiences, a lot of shitty relationships. I had to fuck up a lot, you know, um, I say I, I, I'm a relationship expert because I've made like every single mistake and somehow Life story. called my way out of it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. And then, you know, I, I went to school and kind of just fell into this niche of working uh, primarily with, with couples and people who are going, you know, dealing with different attachment issues and uh, trying to navigate this really challenging thing that we don't have a blueprint for and we're not taught how to do. Um and, and yeah, I, I now see clients from all over the world and, um, which is also really fascinating to see people from different cultures and socioeconomic backgrounds and all that stuff and realize like, we all have the same problems. The more, the more personal it gets, the more universal it, it becomes. So, so yeah, here we are. It's so funny. I had someone today uh, when I was live and she was like, do men feel the anxiety like women? And I was like, wow, mm. Ev we're humans. Like there's so yeah, many yeah, people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah that just kind of side note. And yeah, for so many people, like I've, so I've been following you for a while just because I love the way you articulate things. I love the mm. way you put into bite-sized information, the amalgamation of bullshit that's happening in my head. You somehow seem to make it very <laughs> organized. So <laughs> I'm excited to introduce the community to you. And I think today, something that I see you post a lot about that I talk heavily about really is like mm -hmm. emotionally unavailable, avoidant, anxious, yeah. avoidant, trap, things like that. And so I kind of wanted to jump in because what I'd like to do, I have my own like definitions and shit, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on like, yeah. what is it, what does it mean to be emotionally unavailable first off? And then we can kind of go from there because I think that's just a term that no people are very confused about. Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, I think, um, emotional unavailability speaks to your relationship to self, not to the other person, which I yes. think is a big misunderstanding. Um, and when someone's emotionally unavailable, we might take that personally or think it's some, you know, because of something we did, but truly if you are not available and present to your own internal landscape, and if you don't know how to navigate that and sit with pain and fear and rejection and love and all these really triggering emotions, it's going to be extremely hard for you to be in an intimate relationship with somebody um, who isn't just, who isn't also avoidant. And you're just kind of on the surface. Like if you're looking to be in an intimate relationship with someone who wants to do the work and wants to have real conversations and wants to progress, you got to be um, familiar with your internal landscape. And that's what I think emotional unavail unavailability comes down to in a nutshell. Yeah. I used yeah. to always say, I'm like, think about it. There's somebody that is so disconnected from themselves. How would you yeah. like them to also connect with you? It's like, yeah, yeah, it's not going to happen. Like, and, and, uh, to what you were just saying about that, that person who asked that question, like, do men feel the anxiety? I mean, as, as you were getting at, yes, they feel the anxiety. Um, there's actually numerous studies out there that show that men feel more anxiety than women. They just don't have a container to express it. They're not allowed to show it. So the only other option is to shut down. And that's what dissociation is. Dissociation is something that happens when our pain or our anxiety doesn't have a solution. Mm. Um, so men, I think, culturally feel far farther away from a solution than women because they're not allowed to fucking talk about it. Yeah. So, or feel it, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's so funny. Cause growing up, I never understood my mom disassociated. She was very disorganized. Mm. Like she had a yeah, lot yeah, of yeah. like childhood, severe, like immigrant childhood traumas. And I didn't understand it for so long. And now that I've started to do all this work, it's like, I come, I have so much more compassion for people that are dealing with this. That's why mm. uh, the one fucking statement I hate more than anything is if he wanted to, he would, because it yeah, just, yeah. it lacks yeah. so much empathy and compassion yes. of like, 
oh, I'm sorry. Everything is just chalked up to wanting it. Well, you know what? I want to be yes. a millionaire. So I guess I'm just, that's it. Yes. I must not want it bad enough then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I'm glad you said that because I think there's, this is something that I'd really like to actually ask you. So typically speaking, in my experience, avoidance are the emotionally unavailable ones, right? Like, do those kind of well, go hand in hand? Yeah, but anxious people are emotionally uh, yes. unavailable too. It's just a different, you know, I don't know if you want me to get into that, but- Please, I would love to see yeah, how it well, differently. So, I, I mean, I think all, whether you're disorganized, avoidant, or anxious, it's all emotional unavailability. Um, uh, maybe avoidance are more obvious because yeah. when you're when you're talking to an avoidant and they shut down, they're dissociating. I mean, it's clearly you're like, you are not even available. You're not even in the room right now, Right. An anxious person, though, is also tapped out. Like, they're not connected to their needs. They're not centered. They're freaking the fuck out in total panic mode, right? So that's not also not being emotionally available because when you're in that state, you're not able to hear your partner. You're not able to even hear yourself. You're just in total fight or flight trying to um, find a panacea for your pain. So it's 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 all kind of in the same um, realm, I guess. I'm glad you said that. Cause there's like this, this myth, there's this thing going around where avoidance yeah. are so villainized as if it's like, yeah. I had somebody today and they wrote, and even I, I said yeah. it to my boyfriend, he looked at me and he was like, I'm pretty sure that's what people used to say it like anti-Semitism and like things like that. We were yeah. like, and he was like, it, they were like, they're sneaky. They're doing this to hurt you and, and all this. Yeah. And I was like, so you think they're so calculated as if they're out of malice. And I'm like, I hate to break it to you. It's the same thing. It's just manifesting differently. I'm like, I don't yes. know why the anxious because they're outward. All of a sudden it's like, woe is me, poor you. But the avoidant is just the big mm -hmm. bad wolf. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your kind of thoughts and experience with that. Because I'm sure you mm -hmm. have seen this in all mm -hmm. walks of life. And also I think what people get caught up is like the anxious avoidant trap. Like how does that yeah, yeah. happen? Yeah. Well, it's all fear. It's all fear of intimacy and it's fear of abandonment. Um, you know, but that, but this is what's so sad because if you have someone who's really avoidant and someone anxious, who's dating, they actually have way more in common than they realize. They're both terrified of being hurt by the other one. And if we could just have the conversation from that perspective, because I, I don't think that you need to be fully cured in your attachment style to have a relationship. I just think that you need to be aware of how it manifests and open to working on it and discussing it and maybe going to therapy or getting a coach so you actually have tools to work through it. But it's like, imagine having a fight imagine a fight happens between an anxious person and an avoidant person. And in that moment, they can both actually just identify, holy shit, I'm really scared of, of, of losing you. I'm scared of getting hurt. Okay. What do you need to take care of yourself? What do you need to take care of yourself? Okay. Let's do those things. And then we, we meet in the middle somehow. It's, it's, it, I think that like anxious people think that their avoidant partners having a completely different internal experience than they are. And I actually think that they're way more similar than, than, than we might think. I love the way you put that because we got a lot of questions of like, do they just not care? Do they just not yeah. feel? And it's like, yeah, no, they, again, they, shut they feel down. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And why, why would you shut down? Because you're feeling a lot. That's the only reason why we dissociate is when it, when, the, when it gets too overwhelming to hold. So, and, and I have compassion for both because, you know, if I've also been anxiously attached and sitting in a room with someone who's completely shutting down or leaving the room or whatever, it's, of course, you're like, this person doesn't give a shit about me. Right. Um, so it takes both, both people to make, if you're in that dynamic in your relationship, it can absolutely work. I see couples all the time um, who are, who one's avoidant, one's anxious. It just takes commitment and courage to sit through it together. Which the keywords are right there, the commitment and courage component. Yeah. Because it's yeah. like, if you have a partner that is always going to constantly bolt out or leave, or like I get the, the one of somebody asked, like, how much space do I give my avoidant? I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. This isn't an excuse for bad behavior. This isn't you get to have a temper tantrum, go into the other room, and then in two to three weeks, you can decide when you're not, you know, when you're now regulated, you get to come back to me. Yeah. Like my boyfriend, he's anxious, more avoided. We're very secure though. Like we've both done ridiculous amounts of work and he studied psychology. Like he's an incredibly aware man. But even the other day we had something he like snapped. He snapped at me, not in a way, like a rude, disrespectful way. He was upset. He snapped at me about something that I said that someone else had said to him. And then what happened? I shut down and it was like, I could see it playing out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, this could go one of two ways. I could either talk to him 
mm-hmm. and just say like, which is the route, of course I went, I was like, or I could shut down and then he shuts down and no one's speaking. And I just simply had to go to him. There was no yelling. There was no arguing. And I said, I really didn't appreciate that. That really hurt my feelings. And then that's when he mm-hmm. said, can I be honest with you? I felt really insecure and that's how I handled it. And he's like, and by no means, mm-hmm. is that an excuse? He was like, but that's what mm-hmm. came up for me. And mm-hmm. you're right. I should do X, Y, and Z next time I'll talk mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it took me a, you know, for the night, I kind of felt like, I don't want to talk to, you know, I felt a little disconnected, yeah. but then sure enough in the morning, I had to kind of have myself a little pep talk me with my anxious yeah. brain to say, this guy's not, he's not abandoning you. He's not dad. He's yeah. not walking out. This is an yeah. incredible man who wants to work through things with you. And it's yeah. okay that you feel hurt. It's okay to honor that, but it's also yeah. okay to express that and not shut down, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's so complicated and layered and nuanced. Um, and I think part of what makes it so complicated is not having the words for it. Yeah. And that's why I think more men are avoidant just simply because us girls have been talking with our girlfriends forever about guys and feelings and right. And then men, you know, don't have the same conversations that women are having. So when, when they then fight with their, if we're talking about heterosexual relationships, like if they're then fighting with their female partner and she's using, she's naming her feelings and they're like, uh, I actually don't know what I'm feeling. So the fact that your partner is able to be like, I feel insecure. It's like just naming it is what can heal and avoid an attachment style or an anxious attachment style, just naming exactly what you're feeling. And I think the problem is we lack the the verbiage for it. We don't know how to communicate it, not because we're stupid or we don't care or we don't want to, but because we're not taught. And if our blueprint was our parents, well, fuck, for most of us, that's, uh, that's not good. A hundred percent. I mean, my first, my sister and I would always do that practice. And this is kind of even what I do with clients. It's like, where'd you learn this behavior? Like I used yeah. to say, I'm like, I'm too much. And my sister was like, where'd you learn that? And I was like, yeah, yeah. you know, it's like, it hits you. And I was like, I had an emotionally unavailable parent who did yeah. not know how to be around. And it's like, that's all I saw. I saw my mm-hmm. mom not have boundaries. And I saw my mm-hmm. father mm-hmm. treating her mm-hmm. however he wanted. That yep. doesn't mean excuse or explanation. It's like, that doesn't, I'm not using yep. this as an excuse to excuse bad behavior, but it's more of a starting point of, because I think a lot of people will get upset of like, oh, if you know, I keep going after emotionally unavailable people. It's like, well, then are you aware of what it is that you want? Do you have boundaries? Yeah. Are you speaking yeah. up? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I ask you, for somebody who's in that position, because I'm sure you deal with people that come to you in all different walks of life in different parts. Let's say somebody has like never done therapy. They're kind of new to all of this. And if they're yeah. looking and saying, I'm noticing a pattern. Okay, I keep going for the same kind of guy. What would your advice be for, in your, with where you've been and all the experiences that you've had for this person to kind of start on this journey of like how to even identify what the patterns are, what's happening for them? Mm. Well, I think a lot of it comes down to self-worth. And then we have to look at what environment were you raised in and what didn't you get from your caregivers, not to get so Freudian or psychoanalytic here, but it's like, it all comes from our childhood, right? So it's like, if you didn't get the love and validation that you needed, you're going to grow up with certain self-beliefs. And then you're going to go out into the world and try to recapitulate that trauma with your intimate partner so you can heal it. So you're likely going to pick the same person that, you know, mirrors your mother or your father, whoever had you had the biggest wounds with, or maybe both. Um, And obviously the problem then is, is that they're going to be incapable in the same way that your parents were, but we do that to try to heal it. But we end up obviously in the same situation as we were before. So uh, awareness is a huge part of it of just of just being like oh my dad was a narcissist oh my mom was codependent and you know I was there was triangulation and I was the scapegoat and I felt like everything was my fault so now I date men who also blame me for everything or whatever it is it's like you 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 kind of get a little roadmap from where you started and how you ended up there um and and make sure that you know when you're starting dating somebody, you're not following the same, the same roadmap. Totally. And I, I love, I'm, it's true. It's like, sometimes I'm like, I'm not trying to get all woo woo here of like, it's your childhood. It's like, what? realistically speaking, it's, it's your like, childhood. it's your childhood. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm sure yeah. you get this. I get this a lot of like, no, I had a perfect childhood. I had no issues. No, no. It's because when I was 25, I dated this guy and he was an asshole. That's why. And I'm like, baby, 
Yeah. If it were that easy, if it were just that when you were in your twenties, yeah. you met somebody yeah. that didn't treat you well, it's like, no, because if you had a great parent and again, I'm not trying to villainize the parents, your parents did the best they could with the information that they knew. Yeah. But if your parents had equipped you with the proper mm -hmm. tools, then seeing this behavior, because like, that was mm -hmm. my thing. And I'm, you mentioned this earlier. You're never going to just be healed. I think that's such a mm -hmm. fallacy of like, you need to heal first. And I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? I'm still mm -hmm. healing because I'm still yeah. being triggered by my partner. Yeah. yeah. But at the end of the day, what I am seeing is like, I get turned off or like when I was dating, obviously now I have somebody, but when I was dating, I'd get turned off because it's not like you're never going to meet these people. Cause somebody mm -hmm. asked today, how do you see someone if they're avoidant or emotionally unavailable based on their dating app? And I was like, <sighs> <laughs> fuck if I know you know what I mean yeah, I, was like, I have yeah, no yeah, idea yeah, but yeah. what I do know is that within the first few minutes of a conversation or on a date I'll usually be able to pick up on that and I'm like oh you're avoiding this conversation or like you know it's yeah. funny I posted something of like first day, first or second date questions to ask I asked my boyfriend on our first date what are your intentions with dating how did your last relationship end and what did it teach you about yourself I don't give a yeah. fuck about his ex I wanted to know how he yeah, was yeah. going to describe her and talk about her yeah and he was eloquent and beautiful and very respectful. And here we are the amount of people though, that freak out. Like I would never, I'd run if someone said this to me and I'm like, <clears throat> yeah, Can you call out yeah. The elephant? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's hard. You know what I was saying earlier about relationships being nuanced is mm -hmm. I hear so many different ways that relationships started. Yeah. And that's something I think that we actually don't hold enough because of our own fear. And I admit to this, like some, I've definitely done this before where it's like, give me the black and white, like give me the equation that's going to get me the best relationship. And I don't want the gray space. And if there's, you know, and then after you do this work for a long period of time and, you know, I've seen hundreds, if not thousands of people by now who have completely different stories of how they got into something, things that culturally we would shame, things that started from infidelity and are still going 10 years later, you know, things that we like to put in certain categories and say, no, that's bad, or no, this is good, or, you know, people who started out as friends, people who broke up and then ended up getting back together, people where, where someone was, you know, um, <laughs> uh, uh, maybe coming off as avoided in the beginning. And then, and then, you know, and, and I know that this probably isn't what people want to hear because we're looking for the magic bullet. We're looking for the equation that's going to get us to the place that we want to be, which is in a healthy, you know, for most of us in a healthy, stable, secure relationship. However, I would feel negligent to not talk about this. And I feel like we need to talk about this more that like, a, this is, this is why it's so important to form a relationship with yourself first because it, this is about not only having intuition and sometimes throwing away the rule book and saying, how do I, how do I feel about this? Do I trust myself enough to move forward with this? And do I trust myself enough to pick myself back up if it does fail? You know, a love is a, a lot of risk. Like you have to take some chances. And sometimes there were people that, you know, I, I would have maybe had advised to not move forward in something and then they move forward in it and, and, and it works out. And I'm so glad that I didn't because they had, they trusted themselves. They knew, they knew themselves better than I knew them. Um, and I think a lot of this work is just supporting people to get back to themselves, to get in touch with that inner voice that, that doesn't need to, 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 to always look outward and, and, and look on, you know, my Instagram page or, or whatever. And, and, you know, I think a lot of this work is actually like listening to the voice within, if that makes sense, not to say that there clearly are not people who are avoidant, who have major red flags. And yes, you should not continue with those people, but you know, the things that are a little bit more in the gray space, I don't know. I think that's interesting to kind of help people figure out how they want to hold it. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you said that. Cause like even my relationship started unconventionally in the sense where like he wasn't yeah. texting me all the time and I right, was right. And I was paying, he wasn't my type and he was very yeah. pissed off. And it's like, and do you know how many people are like, oh, just break up with him. You don't like him. You're not getting it. And I was like, you know what? I trust myself that no matter yeah. what, I'm going to be yeah. okay. Cause I was good before right. this guy. I'll be good after him. Right. Honestly the surrendering component of it, like just not trying to control, not trying to attach to the outcome yeah. and just saying, you know what, things that I used to do, they ain't working for me. So yeah. let me try yeah. something different. 
because it's true. It's like, I will, I'm kind of with you. Like I will, when people ask for advice, I'm like, listen, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to tell you what to do because I'm not you. But what I will say is based on the information that I've received, because I can only go based off of the limited information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's what I would deduce. If I were going to take my money and bet on a guy that after six months is refusing to put a title on it, doesn't want to have conversations with you. You still find him on the dating apps. Yeah, yeah, your yeah. needs aren't being bad. No, I'm not going to tell you to keep investing further into this person. But yeah, you've met somebody and after a couple of dates, there's a little confusion and I don't know. And is this a, yeah, if you trust yourself going, yeah, well, no matter what, I'm going to be okay because that person doesn't owe me anything. I yeah. think then you can change the way you date and change the relationships that you'll have with people because, oh, here's a spoiler to all of my anxious folks. You actually allow something to develop instead of anticipating yes. worse or jumping into it has to end. It's like, maybe we just allow naturalness to happen and that the other partner will feel safe and that they can yeah. disarm so that you can disarm and yeah. find a relationship. Right. Exactly. And you know, there's probably guys that you would have not done that with, but that maybe there was something in you that said something of, you know, about your current partner where you were like, I'm going to try something new. And that's what I mean about intuition. It's like, it's hard. And you're saying like, people were like, well, break up. He's not texting you back. And it's like, but you knew something and something in you was saying, yeah, but just chill and see where this goes. And that's the other problem. I think we like rush these things into developing. And I was just writing about this today. There's a difference between being ambivalent and taking things slowly. Yes. If you're ambivalent in the first four, four months, that's, that's, that's marked by hot and cold behavior, um, being invested, then pulling away, saying that you want something, then doing something else. That's ambivalence. Taking something slowly is, is just letting it breathe. There's a natural, steady progression, but that I think sometimes can be can be confused as ambivalence or somebody being avoidant or right. Cause we want it and we want it right now and just letting something breathe. And, and really just the question is like, has this been consistent? Is there, is there progressive effort? Like, are we, are we connecting? Right. Obviously this thing is a time If you're doing this for two years. Well, yeah, no, that's probably, unless you both are cool with that. But if someone wants more, like that's not going to work. But in the first, like, three to five months of dating, I don't know, you're kind of getting to know somebody. <laughs> right. And well, to maybe, us, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to yeah. us, we're like, yeah, I'll just keep getting to know it. it I, I know at least when I was so hyper anxious, it was like, you know, and that's kind of the thing is like, oh, I've, I've always felt like I was gonna be abandoned. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not dating my dad. Like, you're yeah. not dating your caregiver. You're not being abandoned by a guy that you literally had one fucking date with. Okay, right. the guy said he was gonna yeah. call you and he didn't. So all of a sudden, you're not worthy. And you're the piece of shit. And you fucked everything up. And this was the one it's like, mm -hmm. okay, let me ask you a question. What's his middle name? Where mm -hmm. did he grow up? What's his mm -hmm. favorite food? You don't know shit mm -hmm. about this person. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what you'd like mm -hmm. them to be. And I think- yeah, yeah. That's also, it's like just allowing it to progress. Cause I can tell you right now, I put money on it. Yeah. If I had acted in the way that I used to with my current partner, we would have broken up within the first week because I would have yeah. totally kiboshed. Cause it was this, like you said, when we'd leave, I'd go, yeah, but he's super consistent. He shows up. He's reciprocal. Yeah. I don't have to guess where I stand. If I ask him a question, he's very upfront. He's the one who like, yes. make all the yes. but yeah. Okay. So he's not texting me every day. That was where I had to tap into myself to say, okay, but this is you mm -hmm. feeling like you're going to be abandoned and rejected. That's why I'm also a big component of like, you don't need to text all the time in the first month of dating. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. maybe let it happen. And, oh, I don't know, get to know somebody. But yeah. ultimately too, understanding that the point of dating is to see if yes. you have something. Yes. Not, yes. there's no commitment in dating. Yes, yes, yes. You, you, someone once said to me, you need all four seasons to get to know somebody. And that. yeah, it, it's so true. And it's like, you know, we can, I, I think, especially like when we're having sex and things are really hot and heavy and there's chemistry, it's like, it's like, we can feel so close to this person and like, we really know them and lo and behold, something comes up six months later. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's a lot of times when I think we try to rush the natural progression of things, it blows up in our face. And just chilling out a little bit and letting things and also like 
having fun in the beginning, yes. dating and allowing the courtship to happen and getting excited about things and maybe not seeing them every other night and letting there be a bit of space. It's like, that's all it's fun. And it's also a way for you to stay present in your life yes. with your friends, with your hobbies. So if things don't work out, you don't feel like, you know, your skin went with them when they walked away. Oh, I love that. I know I had done, I did a video about like distance creates desire. And I'm like, not intentional. Like I'm going to put space. I'm like, I don't know, right. go live your fucking life. Like yeah. go out yeah. and have your girls night. Yeah. Go, no, sorry. I can't make it tonight. I have plans. Yeah. Do you watch I, for a lot of people that follow me know, I love this fucking show. Do you watch the show? Um, it's trash love during lockup or love after lockup. No, oh my no. God. <laughs> oh my God. It's uh, my boyfriend. He was like, listen, if we're going to watch trash, we're going to watch the best trash. And it's, it's exactly kind of what we see. It's like these people that have these completely digital relationships with inmates, like these people uh -huh. are in prison. And so there's somebody on the outside and there's someone on the inside. And oh, sure. Wow. And it's like, it's kind of like 90 day fiance too, where it's like, you know, they're, they're apart. This is exacerbated obviously, because they're in prison and it happens almost every single time where it's like, they get enamored by them. No, this is my person. And they're going to, we're going to live this life. Yeah. They come out or like a 90 day fiance, they meet. And then all of a sudden it's, well, who is this person? And I don't understand. It's like, because yeah, when you're FaceTiming or talking on the phone or texting, you get to see the best version of that person. Yeah, You don't yeah. know that they're unavailable or super avoidant or narcissistic or abusive. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. we don't know these yeah. things about somebody. And I find that the digital relationship aspect to things is mm -hmm. really, I think, hindering our connection ability. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is also the why we need to be a bit more compassionate with ourselves in dating, yes. because I also have a lot of clients and I also used to do this all the time where if something didn't work out, I would really beat myself up for it. Find all the things I missed, like, you know, make, just look at them until they're seared into my brain. So I don't do it again. It's so, it's such a harsh way of dating. And it's like, look, you know, I, I I've known, I've had clients who, who, who have been with people three years later, something really dark comes out. Yeah. Um, you don't always know a lot of this also, and people don't always like when I say this, cause it's scary, but I think it's luck, yeah. you know, like, like some it's, this is not, we can't predict everything and we can do all of our work and see all of our, our blind spots and heal all of our wounds and still be shocked by somebody for, for better or for worse. So it's like when you're dating, look, it's like you do what you can do. You you figure out what you can figure out. And then if something doesn't work out, you don't need to flog yourself because, you know, you made a mistake. And I think that's another another thing to, to really pay attention to is um, and this is why dating, not jumping into a relationship, but dating is important. Because it gives you the space to collect data points without beating yourself up when something comes up three months later, because you still, you still have um, a, a bit of autonomy. If of that course. makes sense, I yeah. was. I mean, I still dated other people when I was still yeah. actively seeking my partner because it's like, sorry, I don't really know you that well. Like, and yes. I think a lot. Of, yeah. I've had like a friend of mine. She dated a guy, and after the third date, he asked her to be his girlfriend. And she, when she, the minute she told me, I went, whoa. Why? Why, why yeah, is this person asking yeah. you to be their girlfriend after three dates? No. And she was very defensive with me. And I was like, you know, listen, okay. I'm backing off. Like, sure, sure. You do you. Sure enough. What happened a month later, we find he's wildly avoidant. And when she confronted yeah. him, his response was, I get jealous when I saw, when I see people I'm dating with other people, that's why I wanted. And she's like, that's manipulative. He's like, yeah, I guess so. And I yeah. had to stop. And I was like, okay, let's look at this. Like, let's actually take this to understanding. Like, we are looking so hard at like, that's why I don't even like action speak louder than words. I'm like, no, 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 no. They have to match here because one doesn't, yes, isn't yes, more yes, important yes, than I the agree. other. Yeah. Uh huh. That's not how this works. It's like, but there mm -hmm. are a lot of people that will say, I want exclusivity after one or two dates. And it's like, no, it's because you're trying to quell your anxiety. You want to feel chosen. Yeah, you want to live yeah. the fairy tale and storybook. But here's the one thing that yeah. my, our anxious folks, like you said earlier, are not going to like, it takes time. Yeah. Relationships yeah. and real love and that ride yeah. or die doesn't happen after yeah. three weeks because you spend every night together. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that is something I could not agree with you more. Amen. Like, and that's, I, I think, something that that we just need to fucking get over <laughs> because like, we're trying so hard to speed it up and we just end up shooting ourselves in the foot. It's like, 
guys, it takes time. It just takes time. And what a beautiful thing because all relationships that you engage in, friendships, platonic, romantic, career, whatever, professional, it, you're learning about yourself more in every relationship that you have. So this isn't just about the relationship going somewhere. That's That's something else that can be helpful. It's also like, what am I learning about myself in this new dynamic that's just presented itself? It doesn't even, maybe it doesn't need to go somewhere. Maybe this person just came into your life so you could learn something about yourself that you didn't know before. Um, and I know we all want a relationship and that's totally normal and human where it's biology. We're here to like be in relationships and procreate, you know, it's also being in love with somebody who is a good person is the best feeling in the world. Yeah. Um, but it, it's holding both. It's, it's allowing ourselves to have that longing so to, to long for that, to, to validate that, to acknowledge that, and also recognize what you're saying, which is it takes time, stay in your lane, make sure, you know, that you haven't completely abandoned your life for the stranger. Yeah. And it's funny, somebody had asked a question. I already, in my head, I was like, I knew the answer, but they asked, are they avoidant? Or are they just not that into you? And I was like, I'd like to know mm. your, because I, in my mind, my initial response was like, does it matter? But anyways, I'd still- Yeah, like, that's, yeah. <laughs> but I'd be curious to hear, like, I think more because yeah. one thing a lot of people have been asking me is like, can you talk more about avoidance and like what they experience? So I'd like to see mm. professionally with what you've dealt with, especially with couples, if you can have any kind of interjection in that so we can get mm. a little bit more understanding. We know the anxious, but let's maybe learn and have compassion for somebody who's avoided. Mm, yeah. Well, that was also my initial reaction was just don't waste your time. Like it just, it doesn't matter. Um, what's what's going on but if we're if we're going to analyze the avoidant um I think that for, like what I was saying earlier about dissociating it's like you have to be feeling something to have your avoidant defense mechanism activated interesting so I don't know what they're feeling it would be impossible for me to know that. But if an avoidance defense mechanism is activated, it's because they're feeling something, whether they're feeling something for you, whether they're feeling something that's just, they're just being triggered. What I don't know what they're feeling, but something's happening. Um, and you can't really do anything about it. And I think that that's what it comes down to. And that's probably why your initial reaction was, it doesn't really matter. And I, and, you know, I was just talking about this today, actually with someone, um, you know, they could, they could, they, maybe they really do love you. Maybe they really do think about you all the time, but you deserve somebody who's going to go out of their way to make you feel like they want you in their life. Um, and, and by the way, a, an avoidant can do that. Somebody can be avoidant and still go and still make you feel like they want you in their life. And that's what I meant earlier about, you know, if an avoidant works on themselves, goes to therapy and figures out how to even communicate in the moment, hey, I want you in my life, but I'm realizing I'm scared right now. So that's why I'm shutting down. I just need like five hours to go do something else and then I'll come back. That that makes you feel loved and cared for. The person doesn't need to stop being avoidant for you to feel loved by them. They just need to understand their avoidance a little bit more so they can communicate it to you and work towards secure attachment. A thousand percent. I mean, even, yeah, like it's, it's communication. It's like, it's really just yeah. knowing yourself or even sometimes my boyfriend will look and I'm like, I'm triggered. And it's being able to say, I'm yeah. feeling anxious right now because I have the cognitive awareness. The other question I got a lot was, a lot of people saying like, how can I make my avoidant open up to me? How can I get them to open up to me? Yeah. I'll let you take. Well, this <laughs> I mean, like I was saying, you know, you, you can't make anyone do anything, but if you're in a relationship with someone who is avoidant and you feel like there is an equal investment I'll start there because <laughs> yeah. if there's not, you're just going to end up chasing, chasing, chasing. But if the, you feel like there's an equal investment, somebody is willing and wanting to do the work. Um, I'll tell you, it's not going to get them to open up and that's putting your anxious shit on them. Yeah. That's going to shut them down even more. So in those moments when they're shutting down, I think the best thing that you can actually do for both of you is step back check your own internal landscape, figuring out what's going on for you, figure out what you need. And you can say that to them. And if they can't give that to you in the moment, you can 
it can be a dialogue. Like, okay, if you can't give that to me right now, I'm going to need us to circle back in 24 hours. Um, and then you can kind of give them the space while also holding your needs. Yeah. Uh, but you know, so that might encourage them to, to open up and to come back, but there, but you can't make somebody open up. You can't make anyone do the work. Unfortunately. I'm glad you said it. Cause I, I'm, like, I'm a broken record at this point where it's like, my yeah. first thing will be, okay, put them aside. What are your needs? What yeah. is it that you need from yeah. this right now? So if you have somebody, can you express yourself to this person? Cause I, we've all been there. I think every single person has experienced somebody that, and I've watched them love after lockup. So if yeah. anybody wants to see it, there's this, but there's this one couple so and know. it's like, oh, I know. Yeah. I'm, I'm in it. But it's like, there's this one couple and the guy, it's like every time the girl even says something that bothers him or bothers her of like her, his phone was ringing he was being dicey. And she said, who's calling you? You know, you're obviously making this annoying. And of course, what did he do? I, this is why I can never open up to you. And this is why I don't yeah. feel safe because you always, and yeah. it's like, of course, yeah. straight up yeah. deflection yeah. and throwing it onto the other person. Sure enough, he walked away and did the interview going, yeah, yeah, I wasn't telling her the truth. There was all this stuff. And it's like, and then what did she do? The girl beat herself up and it was, what did I do? Yeah. And like, watching it play out. I was like, you poor yeah. thing. And I wanted to come and hug her, but it's like, this is where not knowing your own needs and boundaries yes, starts to play yeah. in because it's like, yeah, do, is my side of the street clean or did I say something inappropriate out of line that would cause this person to have this reaction? Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, even if you did say something, right, this is what a lot of anxious people do. Even if you did say something anxious or you made a, God forbid, you made a fucking mistake. God forbid. Like, that, God forbid, you were human. You know, that, that's not a reason for somebody... Mm -hmm to shut you out, Completely. you know? And that's the other thing that I think anxious people start believing about themselves. They start believing that they have to be fucking perfect if they're gonna be loved or in a relationship. And if they're not perfect, then they're gonna be shut out, ignored, blocked, abandoned, because that's what historically has happened. Because if you're dating someone who's avoidant, they also tend to deflect. Yes. And not, again, not to, I mean, everyone's deflecting in this dynamic, but they're deflecting in that way. And then the anxious person is like, oh my God, then it's all my fault. I take all the blame. Let me fix it. But if I'm the problem, I can be the solution. And, you know, and that's the other thing the the, the, the anxious person then starts to really embody being a victim. Um, yes. Sorry, 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 sorry. Being, um, well, being both, I guess, but also being a perpetrator. Because because if they're the ones who caused the attachment bond to be threatened, then they still have some semblance of control over whether or not they can heal it. Yeah. Oh, 100%. No, yeah. I'm glad you said that because it's true. It's like, I'll get that word. And I'm like, how much, you know, it takes two people, right? It's like, you can't own everything. It can't all be your fault. It's no. like, so yeah, like you said, I'm glad you said that. It's like, oh, so that gives, so you being a human and saying, hey, I don't know. I'd love it if you planned a date for us because I, I don't feel like you're putting as much equal interest. A normal fucking cognizant adult would go, huh, well, what would make you think that? Oh, you know, I've noticed in the last yeah. three weeks you haven't made, planned a date. I'm sorry, you're right. No, I, I let, me, let me plan a date. Yeah. You're right. That, I can see how that might make you feel. Right. Versus, hey, I've noticed this. Or like, oh, I don't know. Something simple as like, hey, can you call me? Just something very basic. And all of a sudden it explodes and it's, I, my needs are too much. And I'm like, no, no, no. Again, yeah. where did you learn that? Like, mm -hmm. just because you had a caregiver that when you expressed yourself, they shut down, doesn't mean that now mm -hmm. that's all you're deserving. But if that's all you think you deserve and that's all you think you're worth, again, coming back to the self-esteem, well, then yeah, you'll just, yeah. Keep, you'll just keep allowing that into your life. But the number one thing I do see I know you might have Freudianly said victim, but I do see that a lot of like, it's yeah. very, woe is me. It just keeps yeah, yeah, yeah. happening <laughs> to me, not for me. And yeah, they just yeah, keep yeah. treating me poorly. Yeah, and it's yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. The anxious attached person holds both archetypes of the victim and perpetrator and uses them as, as weapons. That's the shadow side of, mm -hmm. of being the anxious uh, attached person, right? Because when it's, when it's convenient to be the victim to get them to stay, you're the victim. When it's convenient to be the perpetrator and blame yourself for everything, you're the perpetrator, right? It's. I like that. And what would you say yeah. would be that shadow archetype for the avoidant? What does that kind of look like? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think, I think <laughs> both, but yeah. in different ways, <laughs> right? I think it, because, um, I mean, the avoidant person, their, their, their main goal is to not 
be invested in whatever um, it, it's to protect themselves from, from intimacy and from getting hurt. So, man, I don't know, actually, I need to think about this. What, we'll, what that we'll, would we'll circle be. back. We're going to do, yeah. I would love to have you on for a part two, cause I'm sure yeah. we're going to get more questions, but great. Yeah. We'll cue that one. And let's yeah, see, yeah. I'm going to choose one last. Turning. Yeah. Well, let's do one last question before we kind of break it off. Okay. So somebody asked how to be emotionally available and break the cycle of overanalyzing to run away. So I think this person is coming at it from a more avoidant stance. So kind of, we've answered this, but I'd like maybe a recapitulation of maybe for both people, if you are noticing that pattern, what is the first thing you can do to break the cycle? If you're emotionally unavailable, seems like it had to be, like emo- they said how to be emotionally available and break the cycle okay. of overanalyzing to run away. Okay. Of overanalyzing to run away. Um, Mm, so kind of using like, uh, like overthinking as a, as a way to just, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like now I'm kind of, I I guess, repeating myself, but it it really truly is about actually full circle self-worth and like coming back to your center, because if you're overanalyzing something, it's because this other person has now been put in the center of your orbit. Yeah. You know, and it's like, that's obsessive thinking, it's rumination. And when we're in those places, we're anxious. And when we're anxious, we're afraid. And when we're afraid, it's because we've lost touch with ourselves. Um, And and as you were pointing out earlier, if you've known this person for like two months, there's really, you're not being abandoned by your father. You're not being abandoned by your caretaker. This is, this is a stranger. Like you were saying earlier, like you don't even know their middle name, right? So, so if you're overthinking to that degree, um, it's probably because you, you've given this person way more power than you're giving yourself Ooh. and you need to find a way to come back and give that power back to yourself. No, I love that. But that's I don't a know if that answer. answers the question, but okay. <laughs> I think so. When I first read that, that was the first thing I thought was like, again, like, yeah, because overthinking to me is like, I don't trust myself. So I have to think yeah, of everything else. Exactly. And right. Perception of control. If I can, cause I used to do that. I'd be like, okay, let me map out how all of this could yeah, go. And yeah. then I'll know. And then sure enough, it always happened to where like, it was never the way that I had mapped out. I had thought yeah, of everything. Yeah. So I think, yeah, the I think trusting yourself, reconnecting with yourself and like, I don't know, maybe just yeah, and- with yourself. <laughs> Right. And instead of focusing so much on what this other person is doing, thinking and feeling, you got to come back to what you're doing, thinking and feeling. Yeah, Nailed it. exactly. I'm like, yeah. it's not about why do they do this? It's like, why do you keep allowing it? That's yeah, to me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Zoe, I'm so glad we got to do this. This was such a fun conversation. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I enjoyed I, it a lot. For anybody that well, I know you have some some new things, you have a book that came out. And so we're yeah. going to link all of it in the show notes and everything so that people can support you. But where can they find you aside from that? They can find me on Instagram at Zoe Crook Therapy. Um, my book's called Self Love in Action. They can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. My they can just go to my Instagram, my website, um, and I'll have a course coming out in the making right now in a few months. Um, Ninety days to heal from heartbreak. So, stay oh, okay. Tuned. Please let me know when that's live because we get a lot of people that ask, so I can link that. I will. I totally awesome. will. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Thanks. Awesome, Zoe. Well, and for everybody to know, I'll link the book, I'll link your Instagram, I'll link your website. So everything will be in the show notes. They can find you, but just in case, at least now they know. Great. But Great. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you.